Okay, greetings to one and to all. Once again, I want to welcome you to another study in God's Word. Now, friends, we have nearly finished our studies. You know, we're getting more and more deeper into these words. And the deeper we go, the more the Spirit of God is revealing into our lives. Now, in our previous study, we went through the study on prophetic gifts. And we saw the identifying marks of a prophet. Now, I hope you have bore in mind all that we have studied in regards to the marks of a prophet because as we go through this subject you will see everything come into play everything will be connected also it will show why I believe God has raised up a prophet in these last days at the end of this study I'm going to send you a challenge and I would love to have your feedback on the book that I'm going to recommend now friends as we understood in our previous subject if we are faithful and if we are diligent to be in regards to being students of the word of God, we must test every single thing that we that is mentioned. You know, it usually comes down to the case that we tend to feed off what other people say, which isn't bad as such, but the question is, what do they believe? You know, they can give their opinion on all sorts of things, but the question is still, what do they believe? So friends, if we have taught the right foundation, we will be able to understand and discern what a true prophet is. We will also discern what a false prophet is, and that's simply by studying what is true. So friends, let us be diligent. You know, we don't want to refuse a prophet without being diligent. You know, God could be trying to speak, say something to us, and God forbid that we will reject that prophet. And you've seen what happens when we reject prophets. We saw it all the time in the Old Testament when the Jewish people rejected the prophets that God tried to send to them, telling them to come back to him. But all they did was kill the prophets. So friends, let us be diligent. Let us be very, very careful because we need to know if God is trying to speak to us. So my friends, our subject today is entitled Time Prophets. Friends, this is going to be a very sobering, very intense and a very, very exciting subject. Now before we begin, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments box. If you have any anything that you want to pray about, you can even leave those in the comments box too. Any comments that promote mockery or foul language, I'm going to instantly remove them. And last but not least, please go back and make sure that you're studying these things for yourself. Now friends, before we begin, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, once again, we want to thank you so much for this time where we're able to study your word and to get closer and more acquainted with you. As we go through this subject, I just pray, dear God, that you'll keep us, that you'll purify us, that you'll perfect us, and everything that we study may be according to your will. Lord, there's so much people out there claiming to have the truth, claiming to be prophets here, claiming to be prophets there. But the only way we're going to know the truth is if we study the truth for ourselves. So please be with us as we study. Send your Holy Spirit to teach us. As we saw in the subject from the Holy Spirit, he guides us into all truth. So everything we study, Lord, I pray that we study it from the Word. These things we pray now, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've gone through these studies on prophecy, we found one key aspect. And that key is for our foundation of faith. You know, we are told today that Christianity is based on blind faith. You know, faith that is mediocre and has no grounds of reality. You know, I once saw a video where this woman was really attacking faith. And she says something which you or may, you know, I may completely find erroneous. This is what she said. She said, faith by definition is believing in things without evidence. Now notice what she said next. She said, Personally, she doesn't do this because she is not an idiot. By this statement, it shows that she had no understanding of what faith truly means. And I don't mean that in a negative way against her. I mean, it could be the case that she hasn't been exposed to the truths and evidences that we've seen in these series. Now, let us look at what God said about faith. John chapter 14, verse 12, rather John chapter 14, verse 29 says this. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, ye might believe. Now, 
Jesus does not say believe me no matter what. Jesus says believe me because based on what I've said, when it comes to pass completely, you can know for sure that you can believe everything else that I've said. Now there is no such thing as blind faith when it comes to believing in Christ. Friends, because we have been seeing here countless evidence in these series of studies that the Bible is both reliable and true. Now some of you may be new to this and may not have seen the studies that we've gone through. Now if you would like to know some of the evidences, please go back and check out some of these subjects that we've gone through. We know we've gone through subjects such as Daniel chapter 2 which I have titled Prophecies Metal Man. You can also check out subjects like Mr. Antichrist and also the longest time prophecy ever. All these subjects and more show evidence on why we have a basis for our faith. Evidence that is set on a foundation. So as we go through this key aspect which is prophecy, let us be very attentive because this subject alone is one of the most controversial topics not only in Christianity but in the whole world. Reason being is that many come here and there claiming to be some form of prophet, some form of deity, some form of higher power. So as we go through this subject on the time prophets, we are going to see what the Bible has to say, what it points out and also how we can know whether we are on the right path. So as we begin, we are going to look at five major areas which help and bring out an understanding as to why God will use prophets and continue to use prophets even to this last day. As we saw regarding the remnant church, they will keep all ten commandments not to be saved but because they are saved and also have the testimony which is the spirit of prophecy given to the prophets which shows us that this church will have an end time prophet. Now the areas which we're going to cover are as follows. We're going to see these key points in number one, the flood. Number two, the exodus. Number three, the captivity. Number four, the Messiah. And number five, the judgment. Now each of these topics will show us a need of prophetic gifts and the prophecies in itself. As we go through these subjects of prophecy, we will see exactly why Christ said beware of false prophets and false prophets will arise based in this chapter of Matthew 24. So as we begin, let's start with the first point. The first point we're going to go through today is the flood. Genesis chapter 5 verse 21 says this, And Enoch lived sixty and five years, and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And Methuselah lived an hundred eighty and seven years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech seven hundred eighty and two years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were nine hundred sixty and nine years and he died. Now you may be asking where is the prophecy of the flood in this? I don't see anything but names and ages and genealogies. Now if you watched the previous subject about the remnant church, you may have heard a little snippet of what I mentioned in regarding the previous subject. If you didn't, please go back and listen to that subject because this subject will make even more sense. Now the key in this prophecy was based on the man Methuselah. It is amazing that his name actually has a specific meaning to prophecy. Now if you break the name down, it actually means when he dies, it shall be sent. Now this was the son of Enoch, the man who walked and talked with God and was taken up to heaven. Enoch did not give his son that name by a chance. He was walking and talking with God as if God had given him a prophecy to proclaim. Now for this to fit in what I just mentioned, let's ask the Bible this question. Did God give Enoch a prophecy and what was to be sent when Methuselah dies? Jude chapter 1 verse 14 says this, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam 
prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Okay, so Enoch did receive a prophecy which was aimed at those who were ungodly. And as we saw regarding his name, or his son's name for that matter, Enoch was raised to proclaim the prophecy about the judgment of the wicked. The judgment was to be executed after Methuselah died. Now we have just witnessed a point as to why a prophet was raised, and that reason was to execute judgment. Now there would be no need, or rather there would not be a need to execute judgment if everything was nice and smooth in the way things were on the earth. Now please bear this in mind regarding why a prophet was raised. Okay, so let's ask the Bible the next question. What was the prophecy of Enoch concerning? Now I did mention that when the flood came, it happened when Methuselah died. So what we will do is go into proof to see if this is actually so. So we're going to go into the nitty gritty and find out if all of these things match up. Okay, now we're going to check out the mathematics just to see how it works. Let's go to Genesis chapter 5 verse 25 and it says this. And Methuselah lived an hundred eighty and seven years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech seven hundred eighty and two years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were nine, nine hundred sixty and nine years and he died. Now it says, And Lamech lived an hundred eighty and two years and begat a son. And he called his name Nawa, saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord have cursed. Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Alright, let's get into the maths for this. So Lamech, as we saw in Genesis chapter 5 verse 28, was 182 years old when he had Noah. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. Now Methuselah had Lamech when he was 187 years old as we saw in verse 25. So what does this all mean? Well between the time of Methuselah's birth to the birth of his son Lamech to Lamech having Noah was 187 years. Now the age of Methuselah when he had Lamech was 187 years. So we add that to 182 which is the age of Lamech when he had Nawa and we add that to 600 which was the age of Nawa when the flood came. I hope that all made sense. So if we put 187 plus 182 plus 600 we come up to the figure 969. Now friends, how many years did Methuselah live for? The Bible says he lived 969 years. He died the same year the flood came. Now this is what we need to cling to. God raised a prophet in such a time as that to proclaim the prophecy of judgment on the earth. That prophet was Enoch. God then rose up another prophet to announce a closing period of that prophecy and that prophet was Noah. Friends, do you think it was a coincidence that the flood came right on time, on the date when the man whose name means when he dies it shall be sent? Do you think that was going to happen by chance? I don't think so. Friends, God knew what he was doing and knew that there would be a time when God was not going to strive with men forever in that time period. That prophecy of Enoch was a message of repentance. For 120 years, Noah was preaching to the whole world about the flood in order to save those who wanted to live a life of righteousness. He made a boat 
or rather an ark, by the direction of the commandment of God and acted out his faith, even though he had never seen rain before. Now while God gave a prophecy concerning judgment, he made a way of escape for those who wanted to heed to the invitation to be saved through the 120 years of preaching. Even by an analogy of Methuselah's lifespan, it had shown the mercy of God. Just think about it. This man outlived Adam, who was 930 years. Methuselah was coming to his thousandth year, showing how long God was patient with his people. Friends, God is so good and he's so merciful, even to the point that today he's still calling people to accept him. So to conclude on this part, we can understand that God raises up a prophet when it comes to the execution of judgment. He also raises up a prophet to proclaim that the end of that judgment is coming to a close. So what we shall do is name these prophets. So we can call the prophet that has been given the prophecy a proclaiming prophet. And we shall call the prophets that announce the end of that prophecy gathering prophets. So to give an example, Enoch would be classed as a proclaiming prophet and Noah would be classed as a gathering prophet. So I hope this makes sense. It will make sense as we carry on in this study. Now let's head to the next scenario. The next scenario is the Exodus. Question: Did God use a proclaiming prophet regarding the time of the Exodus? Genesis chapter 15 verse 13 says this and he said unto Abram know of a certainty or surety rather that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them four hundred years and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterwards shall they come out with great substance Abram who was later changed to, as we know, Abraham, was told from the beginning concerning his people that they would be strangers in a land not known to them, some 400 years. Can you imagine the concern in his heart regarding this? Abraham, who was known for his faith, was told that his loins, the children from his loins, he would make a great nation, a nation that would be as the sand of the sea and of the stars of heaven. He was to be told that his children would be placed in a land, a strange land, for 400 years. Now here we mark Abraham as the proclaiming prophet because the announcement of this prophecy begins with him. But do we have any indication on any starting point of the 400 years? We want to be crystal clear about this, don't we? The only way we can find out is if we ask the Bible. So let's ask the Bible. When did the 400 years begin and was there a gathering prophet to announce the end? Exodus chapter 3 verse 7 says this, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Okay, God here has heard the cry of his people, and he knows that they need deliverance. I really like this passage because it's so beautiful. The same way we are in need of deliverance over the things in our lives. God hears your cry and God hears my cry. You know, you may be addicted to things such as alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, pornography, anger, and it's, it's, it's causing breakups in your family. It is destroying your life. It can be anything for that matter and you want deliverance from these things. But guess what? God hears your cries and he's come down to deliver you. Exodus chapter 12 verse 40 says this, 
Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The proclaiming prophet was Abraham. The gathering prophet was Moses. He was called to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. You know, it's just like the gospel. God says to Satan, as I mentioned, let my people go. Okay, now notice the timing. You may say, hmm, I thought it was 400 years that the Israelites were afflicted in the captivity, but it says 430 years. Now, if that's what you thought, you are right to think that. But notice what it did and didn't say. It says 430 years of sojourning not a 430 years of affliction. With further study, it becomes clear the 400 years of affliction is within the 400 years of, rather the 430 years of sojourning. So both periods end at the same time. Now on request, I can go into this a lot deeper, but, but because of time, um, we're going to move on to the next section of the prophecy, which is the prophecy of Jeremiah. Now his prophecy was regarding the 70 years of captivity. Now, Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 10 says this, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work, rather my good word towards you, in causing you to return to this place. Now because of the children of Israel's apostasy, constantly committing sin on every side, they were taken captive by the Babylonians. Seventy years marks the period that they will remain in Babylonian captivity. Now in the book of Daniel, there is another prophecy we have gone through in our very previous study. This was regarding the 70 weeks prophecy, but that prophecy is different from this one and you will see as we go along why that's the case. So Jeremiah was this prophet to proclaim the 70 years of captivity. Now we want to ask the Bible, when did this time prophecy of 70 years end? Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 says this, Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia that he, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying. Okay so what we see here is that in the book of Ezra we have a mention of the prophecy concerning Jeremiah. Now the specific times can be calculated by the reign of the kings to get a correct date. Now Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 um, you can read this in your own time, but the first year of King Cyrus, King of Persia, reigned 536 BC, and this was when the captivity ended. Now Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 and 2, this marks the beginning of the prophecy of the captivity. Daniel and Ezra are mentioned in this prophecy regarding the captivity of Babylon. It seems as if we have a few gathering prophets, but let's keep investigating this prophecy more further. Now let's ask the Bible the question, are there any more prophets with the same prophecy of the 70 years in mind? Now it's so imperative that we understand what's going to be read next. Now this, everything what we're going to see will be answered in part 2. Now friends, I hope that we have gathered an understanding and are starting to notice the resembling pattern. Just to summarize, when God raises a prophet at the beginning of a prophecy, he always raises a prophet at the end of the prophecy. Now as we go along, we will see how much this connects, but you have to make sure you understand what was presented today as we, as we now head into the next part of part number two. But let us remember the main imperative reason behind this whole study. That reason is that we are to discern 
a genuine profit from a counterfeit profit that we may be able to remain undeceived and to also maintain our position in God's will. And so what we need to remember in this study is that one, we have what's known as a proclaiming prophet. This prophet is raised up for God to try and bring his people back to him and to also mark off a time of judgment. But the prophecy that that proclaiming prophet speaks of does not get fulfilled in his lifetime. It gets fulfilled on a later date. And that's why we have a gathering prophet. Because this prophet gathers up the prophecy that was proclaimed by the proclaiming prophet. So just to recap what we've seen. Abraham was a proclaiming prophet. Moses was a gathering prophet. Enoch was a proclaiming prophet in regarding the flood. Noah was a gathering prophet who brought about the end of that prophecy. And now we just seen in Jeremiah that he was a proclaiming prophet regarding the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And now we see Daniel and Ezra as gathering prophets. But as we go into part two, we're going to see more and more meat in this study. And as we go deeper and deeper, we're going to find out exactly what kind of prophet we have today. So my friends, I pray that you've gathered an understanding as we head into part two to talk about time prophets. Please bow with me as we pray to close. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so, so much for this study. We've just come through to part number one of this study and we know that part two is going to show us so much more intensity, so much more meat in this subject and so much more that we can understand and remain undeceived, especially in the time that we're living in right now. Lord, you know that the enemy is going to try and keep us deceived, but if we just follow your truth with a genuine heart, with an undefiled mindset and also with a diligent spirit, we will come to the point of truth. Lord, keep us in your word. As we head in part two, help us to understand further based upon the principles that we've learnt and may we always be ready to defend what is true. So we thank you for this day. We thank you for this study. Prepare us for part two. In Jesus' name, amen.